Hello, and welcome to lecture on protein secondary structure prediction. So the reading is Xiong chapter 14, and there are a couple of optional papers which you can read if you're interested. Uh, the reason I, I, I put these up is because I think it's, it's, there's sometimes a tendency in bioinformatics to, um, to, to focus on how the method works, the mechanics of you know, what are the steps that it, that it follows and, and what sort of results it gets, uh, and not so much on the derivation and, and where it came from. And so in the case of true and Fassmann, for instance, uh, this is a method that's frankly not very good, uh, but it was the first, you know, basically more or less the first method of, for predicting secondary structure. And what I think is really interesting about this is how it was derived from from physics, from the idea that uh, that uh, the protein folding starts with a nuclei nucleation event in a piece of secondary structure, which is then followed by an expansion. And this is very much like, like the, the process of a bubble forming in, let's say, carbonated water and then expanding. There's a certain bubble di minimum bu bubble diameter and then, and then there's an expansion phase. Uh, so I, I thought that was, that was actually quite interesting. Uh, you know, so, so, so even though that method really didn't work terribly well, uh, it, it had a great impact in the development of the field, right? Because then other, others followed on. But, and the, the point is that, that the better you ground your methods in the underlying physics or in the underlying information theory, not only is it going to make your method better, it's also going to have more of an impact on the field. Uh, and the second second paper is Garnier Osgothorpe Robson. Uh, so they, they made the, the, the method called Gore. And what's interesting about this is that here here's another method where, where people just just say, oh, this is the table, just just add up these numbers, and it works like this. Uh, and some of them will even tell you uh, more or less how it's derived. But but actually, it, it was very interesting how it was developed. Um, not really, frankly, as, as a Bayesian method, the way we're going to treat it here, but, but as an information theoretic method. Uh, and it, the, the math gets, gets way too complicated for, for, for uh, an introductory course like this, but you might find it interesting to, to read. So um, what topics are we going to cover today? We're going to start with ab initio methods. And by ab initio, we mean methods which start from uh, uh, primary sequence. sequence. Uh, that, that is to say that, that you 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 um, assume, assume that you know only the primary sequence, sequence not the not, not the sequence of any homologs, no structure or nothing like that. Uh, then we'll 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 go to methods based on homology, meaning methods where we have more than one sequence available in, in a certain homologous protein family. Uh, and then we'll go on to neural network methods and talk about how, how to score the results. And lastly, we'll talk about predicting coiled coils, which you hopefully remember from uh, our lecture on protein structure. So the first method I want to talk about is Chu and Fassmann. So what, what Chu and Fassmann did was they, they compiled this table of, of um, the propensities of certain amino acid types to appear in certain types of secondary structure. And so, so what, what we mean by pr propensity is, let's say in the case of alanine, uh, the propensity of alanine, it means the probability of finding alanine in a helix divided by the probability of finding alanine anywhere. And so that, that just means to get this, all, all you had to do was, was collect all the residues that are in helices and count how many of those are alanines. And so that gives you one number, and you divide, you're always going to divide through by something like the, the, the marginal probability. So in this case, the probability of finding alanine anywhere. And the idea is that if this is, if this is ratio is greater than unity, then uh, your propensity is high. And if, it, if the ratio is less than unity, your propensity is low. So this, this should uh, be some the sort of table that you can look at, and it should, it should make sense to you in terms of the physical chemical properties of uh, amino acid side chains that we we're discussing earlier in the course. So, for instance, um, in the case of, of helices, 
we've already talked about how uh, proline uh, has a very uh, a restrictive Ramachandra plot, and it's it's one that's not compatible with secondary structures. So, so or at least not with alpha helices or beta strands. So, um, so sure enough, proline has a number less than unity for both alpha helices and beta sheets. So it's a helix breaker as well as a beta sheet breaker. Then um, th what things that are compatible with, with alpha helices are things like alanine. You see it's got a nice high number here. Uh, glutamate, uh, let's see, uh, leucine, and a few others. Uh, Let's see, and 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 Trinvasma also looked at turns. So so turns are very tight pieces of secondary structure, like for example, at the uh, connecting two two beta sheets that are anti-parallel to each other. And so what Chu and Fossman did was that they they looked at the primary sequence, whatever that was, A L K R N G, blah blah blah, and they scanned a a six residue window. Let's just make this R. And if any if, if any four contiguous residues have high propensities, let's just say these four had, had propensities higher than one, then you declare a helix. Then you extend. You continue to left or right until the, the until the probability of helix drops below one. So maybe if you if you got all the way to a, to a helix breaker like this, then you would stop. And similarly, to predict beta sheets, you would scan again, uh, and this time you would use a five residue window. Uh, so you say like R K A L Y N, uh, whatever Q P. And so, so let's, let's say that these first five residues had three consecutive residues that were helices, or that had um, propensity greater than unity, then you would declare, uh, did I say helix, I meant beta sheet. You declare beta sheet. Then you would try to extend to the left and right until you hit some, some beta sheet breaker, right? And so, so, so maybe your final beta sheet would look something like this. And I haven't really looked at at these numbers, I don't know if these, if it would actually work, play out like this, but that's the idea. Um, and if if any of these ever overlapped, like for example, let's say you had some piece that was declared both alpha helix and beta beta uh, sheet, then you would go with whichever one had the greater uh, propensity. And so 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 as I mentioned, this this is based on uh, early work of Zim and Bragg. Uh, who proposed that alpha helices have a nucleation site, which then extends. So that means that if, you, if you're in solution, you have some sort of extended uh, polypeptide, there might be some, some piece of it that has, that has really good helical propensity. You know, uh, I don't even know, I, I'll, I mean, it's arginine, okay, something like that. Uh, just, just basically residues that have high propensity. Uh, that, that form helices nicely. And the nucleation site, site would be that. It, that's, that basically means that your alpha helix would sort of form some sort of proto-alpha helix here. And then let's say that there, there were some perhaps lesser but, but still um, above unity um, propensities uh, out here, then this, this, uh, this would then extend, right? So, so this would start to fold like this. Right, and maybe maybe over time, and uh, we're probably talking very fast time. But anyway, over, over time, this, this helix would, would reach its, its final length and then stop, right? Because it hits a helix breaker, or because the the propensity just in general starts to be lower, or because it, there's higher propensity for something else, like for example, a beta sheet. And the beta sheet would also have the same sort of dynamics, where it starts out with this uh, nucleation site and then extends. Uh, and there might be some competition for some time between the end of the beta sheet and the start of the alpha helix, but they'd somehow settle into, into their, their final boundaries, uh, and then that would be it. Then you'd have this, this beta sheet. Oh, actually, it'd go the other way. Uh, and so, so all this was based 
on 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 even earlier work uh, on nu things like homogeneous nucleation. And homogeneous nucleation studies things like how do gas bubbles form, let's say, in a, in a glass of carbonated water. And it turns out that, that there's a competition inside a gas bubble uh, such that there's an entropic benefit for, for the gas molecules to be inside the bubble. But there's also uh, an energetic cost in terms of fighting the, the surface tension on the surface of the of the bubble. So for very tiny bubbles, the surface tension wins and the bubble collapses and disappears. And for bigger bubbles, the entropy wins, and so the bubble goes into, goes into expansion phase. So, so, so basically, the point is that there's a minimum diameter for these bubbles. And the same way, uh, Chu and Fassman is based on this idea of a minimum sort of nucleation site for for a piece of secondary structure, which then expands. Okay, so 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 not not a, not turned out not to be a very effective method uh, in terms of accuracy, but it was something that could be done on a piece of paper and again this was this was very early in, the, in in history so so when there's not much else out there people people will grasp it because it has some utility as opposed to other methods which have not yet to come into existence the next method that we're going to cover is called uh, naive bays but before we get into that uh, we have to set set down um, uh, a, a bit of the groundwork so first uh, we're going to need Bayes theorem and so, so Bayes' theorem is is uh, something that, that you could easily memorize, but uh, it's it's going to I think it's going to stay in your mind for longer if you derive it. And the best way to derive it, in my mind, is from the Venn diagram. I, I, I just find it very intuitive. So, so, uh, so, so here we, we have a, a universe. The square is your universe. And there are two subsets uh, of the universe. There's this a, subset A and subset B. And so if the universe is, is basically all possibilities, uh, so, so the probably of being in the universe is unity, then A is some subset of the universe, so there's some probability of being an A, which is, which is represented by this oval here. There's also probably of being in B, and there's a, there's a probability of being in both A and B. So that's A intersect B, right? So, so if you want to ask the question, what is the probability that I'm in B given that I'm in A? What you're asking is, uh, what's this, this probability? If your universe is basically A, right? So this is, this is, this is your u new universe. Right. Somebody told you that you're in A. So the probability of that you're in here, given that you're somewhere in here, is just the ratio of this thing to this whole A, right? And so, so probability of B given A is probability of A intersect B divided by probability of A. Now in a second, I'll just start calling it probability of A intersect B is just going to be the joint probability of A and B. So you can just say probability of A comma B. Uh, but anyway, so th this 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 should be graphically quite intuitive, and so it should be equally intuitive to do the the uh, to the dual of this, and say um, the probability of a given b is then the same thing probability of a intersect b or as I said I'm just going to start writing as probability of a comma b the joint probability of a and b divided by uh, yes, you guessed it. The probability of of b, right? So I'm just going to erase this this uh, intersect symbol. I'm just going to replace it with a comma, right? So basically, what, what I'm going to do next is just is just say, okay, these the, what's what's in common between these two equations? Well, it's a comma b. So I'm going to isolate a comma b. So I'm going to move p of a over here to the left. And down here, I'll move P of B to the left. And that'll just leave P of A comma B by itself. So up here, I get um, P of B given A times this P of A that we moved over here is equal to probability of A given B times this P of B that we moved over, right? If you want P of A given B 
times p of b, right? Because those are both equal to p of a comma b. So that's Bayes' theorem. Uh, and so we're going to need it uh, to, to then, to then uh, create a, a Bayes classifier, right? So um, we're, we're heading for what's called a naive Bayes classifier. But if, if anybody were to use something called a non-naive Bayes, uh, then it, it would basically be a classifier that looks kind of like this, where we have a probability of CK, whatever it is you're trying to predict. In our case, CK is going to be secondary structure. So, so one CK might be alpha helix, another might be beta sheet, and a third might be random coil. Right? Anyway, it's the probability of CK given X1 to Xn. So these are, these are a, a number of variables, which for us could be amino acid types at different positions near the residue of interest, right? So X1 might be the amino acid type, let's say eight residues to the left of the residue of interest. X2 might be the amino acid type, seven residues to the left of the residue of interest and so on. Uh, and X of N might be, let's say, let's say um, X of 17. No, um, let's say X of, uh, yes, X of 17. So, so um, the, the, the amino acid type of position, you know, eight residues to the right of, of the residue of interest. So, so, so basically uh, what you could, you could do in principle is basically, is, is just, uh, just add up the number of times that you see a particular piece of secondary structure uh, with a particular sequence in, in this entire 17 residue window. And you could say, oh, well, how many times ha have you seen like this thing be alpha helical when X1 is alanine and X2 is leucine, X3 is isoleucine and K, R, P, blah, 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 all the way up to, to Xn being, I don't know, let's say leucine again. So, so, so you could do that in principle, but think about how many how big this table would be, how many possible sequences there are. You're, you're talking about a, 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 um, a 17 residue window where each residue can take one of 20 values. So that, that's 20 to the 17 possible sequences. There's no way you're going to be able to, to parameterize that, right? Not any time in the foreseeable future. So, so just sort of, I guess, you know, if you want to call it non-naive Bayes, simply wouldn't work, right? So we make an assumption and our, our naive assumption is that X1 is independent of X2 and X and, and it's independent of X3 and so on. So all the X's are independent of each other, right? So, so these guys are not related. These guys are not related. You know, these, these two guys are not related and so on. Um, okay. Uh, so, 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 but first let, let me just use Bayes' theorem and put this in a slightly different form. So if you look at this, this is basically, if you, if you identify this CK as A and every, all these X's as B's, then you could say P of A given B um, times P of B is equal to uh, P of A times P of B given A. That's just, just Bayes' theorem, right? And so here I said, this thing is gonna be my CK and B is gonna be all my X's. Uh, and so, so, that, that, so you get this expression here. Um, so, so P of CK given X, X, X1 to Xn is equal to P of CK times uh, P of X1 to Xn given C of K divided by P of X1 to Xn, okay? So that's just a, a direct application of a Bayes theorem. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and you, you're going to notice that, uh, that there's this denominator here, P of X1 to Xn. And that's just as hard to tabulate as, as the other thing that we, we looked at earlier, uh, or almost as hard, uh, because again, th there, there are 20 to 17, uh, possibilities, right? So, so, but in this case, we can get rid of it with a different argument, which is that this, this, 
denominators could be the same for all of our choices of, of CK and, and for, for that matter for all our choices of X1 and so on. So, so um, yeah, for, for all the choices of CK it's going to be the same. So we can just we just take just um, take that as a constant and just just don't worry about it, right? Do not worry. Okay. Now we said that what we we're going to worry about is this is this thing. Oh, sorry, I, I forgot to say one more thing. Uh, so basically, this this numerator is the part that we do have to worry about. And we again apply, uh, well, we apply one of the identities from the preceding slide, and we say, okay, this is a P of A, this is a P of B given A, and so this thing is equal to the joint probability P of CK comma X1 to XN, right? I mean, all I'm saying here is, is, is that P of A times P of B given a is equal to p of a comma b. Oops, that was a little bit too messy. Okay, so hopefully you see that. So th this thing here is our joint probability, p of a comma b. Okay, so 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 we wanted we want this this thing, right? Oh, sorry, this this thing here. That's what we. Uh, now care about and so so uh, we could again apply Bayes theorem and now our objective is to get is to remove this x1 right or, or, or get it by itself uh, on, on here on the one side of this conditional here so so uh, you can see that here here again uh, it's a it's a it's a it's an application of the same rule that that um, that this probability of let's say p of a comma b is equal to, to well we're going to have to redefine let's say let's say now our new a is x1 so p of a comma b where b is everything except x1 so that includes ck x2 all the way to xn but not x1 right so 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 that means that this this is uh, this can turn into p of a given b times p of b right. And like I say, we have something interesting here in that um, this now now this this expression has x one by itself, and over here on the right uh, is is x two to x n, no x one, right? So we, we we managed to get rid of one of the one of the x's, um, and we can make a, a further argument here that that uh, since we said that that all the x's are independent of each other, that means that x2 has no influence on x1. So the probability of x1 given x2 is just the probability of x1. We, that we can just get rid of, of x2, all of the x's we can get rid of. So that's just going to leave, leave us probability of x1 given ck. So already things are, are starting to look a lot simpler, right? Uh, but we still have this other thing over here, which is probability of x2 to xn comma ck. And so, but notice that that's already one uh, x less, right? We, we don't have x one over here, so so that's also getting simpler. Um, so so what what does this become? Like say we take this thing, and we can easily expand it to now probability of x two given x three to x n comma c k. And that times um, p of x three to x n comma c k. Um, and we took to, we we can once again say oh let's get rid of x three to x n, and so that just leaves us with probability of x two given the c k. And over here we have to simplify this a bit more. Um, but again, it's it's already at one x poorer. X one is gone, and x two is also gone. But so you can see every time we we we, we expand these, we we drop one of these x's, and um, so to cut the chase, what we end up getting is something that looks like p of 
x1 given ck times p of x2 given ck da -da 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 -da, times p of uh, xn given ck and then this thing this thing kept dropping x's and so at the very end we don't have any x's left right even the xn is gone so now we have just p of th this whole thing or, or basically the, the joint probably that was always on the right ends up just being p of ck okay i mean if you want it to be a little bit more compact you could say uh product series of p of xi given ck times p of ck right and that 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 multiplies over all i's from you know one to n let's see i equals one to n so so that's 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 naive bayes um and the point is that x the probability of x1 given ck that could be like let's say that the probability that a given um uh, amino acid type at position i minus eight uh, appears when i is alpha helical. That's something that can be easily be tabulated. Uh, all 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 the members of, of all these um, terms of this product series are are easily tractable. And of course, p of c k is just let's say the overall probability uh, of being alpha, alpha helical, right? So count up all the alpha helical residues in the data set, divide by total number of residues. Okay, uh, you know, of course, very, very often you're going to want to take the log of this, and um, because the log of a product is the is the sum of the logs, so to, and you know, sums just are easier to work with. Oops. So um, Gore or Garnier Osgothorpe Robson is based on this idea. Uh, so you can think of, of what they did as a naive Bayes predictor. And it assumes that the position, that the secondary structure at position I depends on the amino acid types at position I minus eight, I minus seven, I minus six, dot, 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 I, I plus one, I plus two, dot, 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 all the way up to I plus eight. So from minus, I minus eight to, to I plus eight, these are all the residues that influence the secondary structure of position I. So a 17 residue window. Um, maybe I should illustrate a little bit more than that. So, so let's say you have your, 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 your primary sequence that looks like, uh, I'm just making this up, A-R-T-Y-W-X, no, not X. <laughs> uh, W um, A L Y N T something. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I need like a bunch more. Uh, a alanine, uh, isoleucine, leucine, tryptophan. Uh, uh, give me a few more. Isoleucine, isoleucine. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Let's just say another I. 18. Uh, no, I don't need 18. I just need 17. So, so basically, all these residues would have some influence on the secondary structure at position I. So, 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this is at, at this position. So, all of these would tell you is this alpha helical? Is this beta sheet? Is this something else? All right? And um, the, the kind of convenient part of this is also that, that these are, are uh, well, I mean, you, you just, you just you, in the, in the case where we did it uh, with, with Bayes' theorem, you would be multiplying them. But, but it turns out if you take the logs and tabulate the logs, then you just end up add, adding the logs because um, the sum of the logs is the, is the log of the product. Uh, okay. And so, so, so basically, to apply this method, what you would do is um, you would um, you look at this table and you say, okay, what's my sequence? 
And you say, Let, I'm just made, made up the sequence that's really easy to, to, to work with. It's, it's all R's to the left. There's a, a, an A, there's Y, Y, and then a bunch of K's, right? Uh, and so, so let's say you had the sequence, then this is um, eight R's. So, so A is a central residue, A is your residue I. So you look at up at R's, um, arginine. Da, 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 da. Where's your arginine? Here it is. Arginine. And you see these all zeros. So all these contribute zero. I mean, it's basically really do doesn't want to be uh, alpha helical, but that's, that's beside the point. Then at position I, uh, it's alanine, and that gives you 60. So, so that gives you a score of 60. So 0 plus 60 is your, is your alpha helix score so far. Mm -hmm. And then um, I plus 1 and I plus 2 are Ys. So tyrosine here. Uh, minus 40, minus uh, 35, and then Ks. Uh, so lysine. And those are all zeros. So this gives you basically a, a negative score for alpha helix. And so you'd compare this to, to your scores that you would get with a similar table for beta sheets and for coiled coils, and you would take whatever whatever is it gets your the high score, which is probably going to be coiled coil in this case. Okay, so it's a it's a relatively simple um, thing to implement. You can even do it by hand for a relatively small number of residues, as I've shown. Okay, so now we're going to talk about homology-based methods. And so homology-based method, uh, it could, could mean a number of things. Uh, one, one way homology-based methods would work is if, if you have a, a structure, uh, a, 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 a novel sequence, but you know the structure of, of, of a related protein, then you can just transfer the secondary structure onto it. That, that's probably one of the, probably the best way to do it. But, um, but uh, uh, more... Sort of more fun, more uh, at a more basic level, like assuming without assuming any structure is available, then uh, what you can do is just do conventional ab initio um, structure, the secondary structure prediction, like we just did, except you did it. You now you have mul more sequences available. Let's say you, you found sequences of of of, of homologs, um, then 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 you you would you run your secondary structure prediction on each of those sequences. And you get some result. Uh, you know, maybe it looks like this, where okay, for your for your query sequence, um, you said okay, it's helix, helix, coil, coil, helix, helix. Then you find your one close homolog, and it says, oh, it's very similar, helix, 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 coil, 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 and then helix. And then lastly, you have um, a second homolog, and this is a little bit different. It says first coil, then helix, helix, then coil, coil, then helix, helix. Right. So, so what you do then is you add up. The scores for each of these, and you say, okay, here I have helix, helix, and coil. So I'm just going to say the consensus is helix, right? Because there's more helix than coil. And then here there's helix. That's unanimous, unanimous helix, unanimous coil, unanimous coil. Here there was a little bit of disagreement, but but the, the on balance is helix. And then lastly, uh, unanimously helix, right? And so so the, the consensus. Uh, prediction is helix helix coil coil helix helix right and so so you, this is there's no there's not that much in terms of fundamental new technology all you did was you took an existing method and you applied it to multiple sequences which you believe to be related and and that that should increase the the accuracy uh, then uh, then we get into um, Neural networks, right? And so, so the first uh, neural network-based method for secondary structure prediction uh, was was um, PhD uh, by Burkhard Roast. And the way PhD works is you're you're scanning uh, your sequence uh, with with a neural network that has that has that has some that's looking at at windows uh, of, of residues. And within each window, it, it fires one of these um, uh, one of these inputs, depending on, on which which uh, amino acid type you have, right? And so, so here, if you have you know a certain amino acid type, uh, let's say uh, amino acid type four, let's say that's um, I don't know, let's just say it's asparagine, then then this this input would fire. 
But the cool thing also is that you could do it with a multiple sequence alignment. And so depending on how many um, how many how many asparagines you have, you, you, you it would be a different input for, for that asparagine node. Uh, and these would get added up and it turned into some sort of secondary structure predictor. And then, then you have this second layer, which is now looking not at residue types, but at secondary structure types, right? So, so th this got, for each position in this window, it's got uh, a node for alpha and alpha for beta and a node for, for coil. And, um, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever it fires at for this position, like, like, let's say beta has 0.18 that gets fed into this, into this, uh, beta node and alpha has point. 03 that gets fed into this alpha node. Uh, and that in turn uh, it gets combined to make this this, uh, this sort of a consensus or, or more informed um, uh, secondary structure prediction. Uh, and then that, that goes to your, to your final final output. Now we're going to talk about uh, scoring predictions. So, so the most common way of doing this is the so-called Q3. And what Q3 does is it, is it says, okay, you know, you, you predicted uh, the state of this of these residues as either helix, strand, or coil for you know some number of residues, and uh, and then you have some gold standard. Like, like let's see, you, you know the crystal structure, and you just you just ask the question, how many of these residues are assigned correctly, and that's your percentage. That's your that's your Q3. Now the drawback is, is that um, it, it penalizes you for things like, uh, you know, let, let's say uh, let's say you have a, a helix. You predicted a helix like this, and then your actual helix is a little bit longer. Uh, so so this 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 would penalize this, right? Uh, even though um, you, you could argue that uh, that they that they got the important part right, which is more or less the location of the helix, and so there are methods that that allow a little bit of forgiveness for for not getting the ends of ends of the secondary structure right, or even missing a, a, sec, a piece of secondary structure in the middle, but getting everything else right. Uh, but but we're not really getting into those so much. And the last thing we want to talk about is um, cold call prediction. So uh, we talked in our electron protein structure about how um, how coiled coils follow the so-called heptad repeat, and heptad repeat means that residues they're buried between these two alpha helices. So see here here are alpha helices that we're looking down the alpha helical axis, uh, and and we're seeing residues. Uh, that are that are instead of being numbered one through seven, we're going to call them A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? And A and D are going to be hydrophobic, right? Why? Well, because they're buried, right? They're 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 packed next to another helix, uh, and we we arranged it such that the residues that are packed against are also called A and D. Right, this is a symmetric situation. Um, and then we have these two that are sort of staples. These are charged, E and G, in both cases, uh, like this, in both strands, charged. And the reason they're charged is because this way they can stabilize the coiled coil. Right? They, like let's say they have opposite charges, then they can interact directly uh, or even even if they have the same charge, maybe they could capture an ion and and and, and bind that way. But um, at any rate, th these are these are charged residues, and the rest can be whatever, right? So 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 if the outside is exposed to solvent, then maybe these are polar, but maybe they're packed against something else, in which they can be hydrophobic. But the, but the point is that is that we're looking for a pattern that looks like um, a hydrophobic, uh, b anything. C anything, D hydrophobic, E charged, F anything, and G charged. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? 
Um, and and if you if you look at your primary sequence, then you should you should expect to see things like leucine, and then something something, uh, isoleucine, then um, let's say lysine, and then something, and then uh, let's say arginine, right? And that would that would obey the pattern, right? But you you can you don't have to look in seven seven residue windows. You can also look in let's say fourteen residue windows and look at the at the cumulative score, uh, and that, that that kind of has the effect of uh, sort of dampening the noise, but it might be a little bit less sensitive in terms of the start and end sites, uh, start end of your of your coiled coil. Um, but anyway, that, that's that's the basic uh, principle be behind coils. And with that, we are going to stop this lecture. And I'll see you when you come in for the discussion.